thank you very much. Um, I uh, don't know if any of you read Sky and Telescope, but in uh, the last November issue of, uh, of, the, of Sky and Telescope magazine, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, William Sheehan, who some of you may know as a rather well-known astronomy historian, uh, decided that since uh, so many of us are getting on in age, shall we say, and uh, most of us and many of us actually uh, became interested in astronomy as young uns uh, when Sputnik was launched and the announcement was made to go to the moon and the like. So I thought I'd throw in some pictures and comments uh, of my journey that way. And if you have any questions anytime, please, please, you know, pipe right in. So here I've got three images that give you sort of an indication of the range of telescopes that I've used over the years. I was always just a professional, an amateur astronomer, never a professional. By profession, I'm a, actually a molecular biologist, now retired. Over here on the left, you can see uh, my first telescope and me looking through it at the sun. It was a very, in 1957, the, the year of the IGY, International Geophysical Year, and the launch of Sputnik. And uh, I was so proud to actually have a telescope that I could afford. And my family was not super wealthy. We had immigrated from Europe to uh, Toronto in 1953. And I was now a high school student. And then here, this middle picture that you see, I have a somewhat larger telescope. Of course, I haven't changed a bit in appearance. I'm still that slender youth from way back when. Uh, this is a Celestron 14, which uh, I've used extensively for astronomical photography. And then uh, after we retired to uh, Flagstaff, I uh, began volunteering in the public program at Lowell Observatory. And I was fortunate to frequently get access to the classic 24 inch Clark refractor, both uh, to show people some goodies in the sky and also to actually use for astro imaging. Uh, the kind gentleman over here is familiar to many of you. That's uh, Kevin Schindler, who is the uh, uh, Lowell uh, Observatory historian. Well, let's begin at the beginning. Um, as I mentioned, 1957 was quite a pivotal year in terms of uh, uh, solar system astronomy. First of all, it was the, uh, um, the International Geophysical Year had been launched and it was actually 18 months worth and really was intended for all the nations who participated, the first international effort to study our planet as a planet. And among those things was to be the launch of a satellite, which uh, was to be an American satellite. And then of course, to everyone's shock, um, the Russians beat us to it with Sputnik 1. And then shortly thereafter, Sputnik 2. And shortly thereafter that, uh, a dog was launched into space. So uh, clearly this uh, woke up everybody outside the Soviet Union and essentially the space race had begun. I was old enough now to join the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, which is probably in addition to the British Astronomical Society, one of the oldest and, and uh, uh, most popular uh, astronomical societies in the world. It was dedicated, I think founded in 1870. And also coincidental in that year, one of the most spectacular comets of all times graced our skies, comet Aaron Rowland, famously known for its anti-tail. Uh, here's a picture that uh, I didn't take, but it was, it was iconic. And I remember walking home one day and, and Toronto was a much smaller city than it is today. And uh, certainly you could still have reasonably dark skies. And I remember we saw it in the sky, my friend and I, and we thought maybe we had discovered it. So we got all excited and don't know what to do, who to call. Uh, and next morning, the newspaper, of course, were filled with the announcement that this comet had just been sighted over Toronto. So we were disappointed, but excited. Uh, after a, a couple of years later, my dad was a 
engineer, uh, electrical engineer, and spoke fluent French. His company moved us to Montreal, uh, which at the time was uh, by far the biggest city in Canada, and certainly still is probably the most interesting, in my opinion. Uh, and there I joined the, um, the Montreal Center of the Royal Astronomical Society, and they were really advanced for their time. Uh, on the left here, you see this, this building with a dome on top. This was situated on the McGill University campus, and the building itself uh, had been used by the physics department at McGill during World War II uh, on uh, experimental Doppler radar. Uh, they were applying it to, to uh, first attempts to you know, do better weather forecasting. And then the club inherited this and uh, set up their own very nice observatory with a six inch refractor. And you notice how everybody's wearing tie, and all the men at least. It was a very formal affair in those days. And very unusual, even for the times then, was that the group was led by Isabel Williamson, who uh, was an extraordinary lady, uh, very much an astronomer at heart, although she worked for an insurance company. And she really led this group uh, to get, especially Young people who joined it uh, were immediately uh, uh, sort of mentored by older members into a variety of, of you know, projects and programs. It was really a, a terrific opportunity. Um, in those days, for those who might remember, we've been that far back, um, we all salivated at owning a telescope like this. Unitron was one of the few really excellent telescope making companies. And this was their sort of, uh, you know, prize of prizes, uh, the photo equatorial because amateur astrophotography was just beginning. And uh, we all salivated at the thought and just for the telescope, it was $550, which was astronomical, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, at the time for people like me. And really today this would be more like uh, $5,500 for the same type of thing. So I had to make do with a more surplus telescope. We got some optical lenses, three inch refractor. And my dad, you see over here, um, and uh, a friend of ours, uh, we put this together from spare parts uh, and it really turned out to be a very good first telescope for me. Notice too that the pipe mount here, we used to call that the plumber's nightmare. Uh, I put that together and I took a shop course in high school and learned to make castings and drill things. And so it was really a, a terrific learning experience. One of the advantages of living in Montreal for astronomy, and uh, it, that's an advantage, but only relative because the winters are brutal, as some of you may know is that a 45 degree angle points almost exactly at Polaris. So you sort of have an equatorial mount. And uh, that's why I did that. <laughs> I really wanted, like so many of my contemporaries, we would salivate even more at a big telescope like this made by the Cave Astrola Company in Anaheim, California. And all the sky and telescopes and other magazines would have these ads but they were completely out of reach uh, financially for most of us. So uh, instead I was able to purchase just the optics, an eight inch mirror and a secondary. And then again with my dad's help and my then 10 year old sister, uh, she painted the inside of the tube. She was the only, she was skinny enough to actually be able to crawl in there and paint it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's very, very proud of this picture. She just loves it. This also appeared in our Sky Telescope article. And again, a similar homemade mount. And it was a very fine instrument. I thoroughly enjoyed that for many years. Now, what we did, uh, the Montreal Center at the time was probably the most active uh, astronomy club in North America uh, and uh, did what most astronomy clubs in the 50s and 60s did, and that was to focus on planetary, lunar, meteorite, solar, and these kinds of things 
because the idea of galaxies and you know other distant objects was sort of beyond our reach and you know at least you could see things on mars and jupiter that and changes and so they, that was really the interest but also again coincidentally with the launch of sputnik and then the space race that ensued clearly the planets now were of great interest to to professionals as well who had largely ignored things up to that point so here you see a series of sketches of mars that i made with that eight inch telescope and the, uh, the whole group of observers uh, in, in our group uh, contributed uh, sketches during the 1960-61 uh, opposition of mars and that was enough information we gathered so that one of our members, my good friend Jeff Garrity, was actually able to combine all of these images. He took a course in geography and you made this Mercator projection of the albedo features that we had recorded. And so that served, at least got him a, a senior research project going, which was kind of fun. Now you will also notice that <clears throat> many of our sketches show these linear features. And again, keeping in mind that uh, although none of us believed that these were artificial canals as Percival Lowell had maintained for so long, uh, but many of us still thought, as did professionals, that uh, there might be enough uh, water ice in the polar caps so that these might be rivers or channels uh, of molten water uh, when the spring uh, came about in, in one of the other hemispheres. So we really knew nothing about Mars, honestly. It was even worse with Venus. Here are a few sketches that we made showing you faint, faint uh, cloud features. And Venus, which is the nearest planet to us and the closest to being a sister planet, has always intrigued uh, people for large measure because at certain times of the year, it's the brightest object in the sky. Uh, with the exception of the moon and sun. Uh, and so it's always had a great mystique surrounding it. Uh, and uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. But Jupiter was our favorite. Um, here's my, one of my sketches of Jupiter. Taken <laughs> very, very and, nice. and you'll notice uh, here's the red spot, the famous great red spot. And here is a sketch of one of the innermost moons, Io, casting a shadow on uh, which is quite easy to see uh, on Jupiter itself. And here's one of the other moons. And then to show you today's planetary science, this is the Juno spacecraft, which has been circling Jupiter now for several years. And this, here's an image of the, the great red spot as captured by that spacecraft. And, and again, the shadow of Io transiting in front of it. I thought that made quite a contrast basically 60 year difference in observations. <laughs> uh, I also delved into astrophotography for the first time. <clears throat> and uh, this was really exciting for me uh, as it was for many amateurs then. Uh, and uh, I couldn't afford what was, had just been issued by the Asahi Pentax company in Japan, the first functional uh, um, DSLR, uh, and uh, and uh, single lens reflex rather, not the SLR. That's today's name. Uh, and uh, they they were was beyond my my price. So instead, what I did, I found they they were in those days they would make these cheap little toy cameras made out of bakelite, and you could throw a film in there, and like a brownie box, you could go out and click, take some pictures, and then develop them. So I used one of those, and instead of a focusing screen, I read somewhere in a book that you could use wax paper as a focusing screen. So I stuck that in the end of my three inch refractor and guessed that I took dozens of images, photos, guessed which ones might be in focus, and bingo, here's that. I was very, very pleased with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And you notice this crater here, for those of you familiar with the moon, this is the one of the most prominent craters on the moon. Uh, and here it is in closer up this, I use the, the club's big six inch refractor to take a picture of Copernicus named after the famous Polish astronomer who of course has showed us that uh, we're not the center of the universe, but that uh, all the 
we're a, a, a solar centric system, at least for our, our solar system. Another thing I want to mention, you notice there's this, this is why I was so pleased with this picture. There's this tiny, tiny little double crater up here. Uh, Copernicus is about 100 miles across, and this little doublet's about 10 miles. And that was named in honor of my mother's second cousin, Philip Fout, who at the beginning of the 20th century was one of the few remaining totally visual observers who tried to map the entire moon. Uh, and uh, the uh, <clears throat> Astronomical Union in, in recognition of his work <laughs> named the crater on the moon after him. So when I showed that to my mother, she was very, very happy, <laughs> as was I. <laughs> Okay, we also joined the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, which is still exists today, and it's really a, a very good organization. It was founded by this gentleman over here, Walter Haas, and here we are at the 1961 ALPO convention in Detroit. Now, this is Walter. This is yours truly. This is Jeff Garrity, the gentleman, my good friend, the gentleman who, who made that nice map of Mars. And this youngster over here is Clark Chapman, who is semi-retired now, but he went on to become one of the leading planetary scientists in the world. Uh, and he's, uh, I'm still in contact with him uh, on occasion. He lives in Colorado and we were all basically kind of excited about astronomy through these organizations and uh, the society, ALPO, ALPO, not dog food, ALPO, uh, organized, he founded this uh, magazine and, and really encouraged amateurs to submit observations and measurements. And then he would publish this uh, uh, little journal periodically. So we all thought we we're doing great science. Now, what was known about the planets? Well, not much. Um, as you can see from these beautiful paintings, some of you may remember those. These were Chesley Aren't they gorgeous? And uh, he and uh, um, Werner von Braun, the rocket scientist who came over to the US and several others would periodically publish these pictures and articles in Collier's Magazine or in books. And the idea was that this is what the first manned expedition to Mars would look like. Uh, and you can't imagine, today it looks kind of quaint, uh, but in those days, the excitement about, oh my God, after the moon will go to Mars sort of thing was, was really uh, rampant among you know, space aficionados. Uh, this image over here, to show you how, how imaginative he was, here he shows what Saturn and its rings would look like from its, one of its moons, in this case, Titan. And what he always did was to actually measure things in perspective so that it was never distorted, it was realistic. Basically, if, if the Earth were this, as close as this moon is to, to Saturn, essentially Saturn would cover half of the sky at any given time. And then here's a depiction by him of what was then thought to be very likely a, a, a picture of the melting polar caps on Mars and uh, that then water might uh, dr drift away from those melting polar caps in the spring along channels. And uh, the reason you could see them was because they had some lichen-like greenery or whatever. And, even as, as, uh, in the, as late as the 1961 or 62, before the first uh, flyby of Mars was undertaken, several uh, professional astronomers were also convinced that there would be water and possibly, including Carl Sagan, by the way, <laughs> and possibly uh, vegetation, primitive type of lichen or, or what have you. Venus was even more of an enigma uh, and uh, even though it's the closest planet to us, it's shrouded in clouds. And so you really can't see the surface. And so there were three separate theories as to what might be going on. Uh, one theory was that it's a steaming jungle because the cloud deck would trap all this heat. And so it must be steamy and, and wet like a, 
an early earth possibly had been. And, other, and, and this is a depiction of what it might look like there with some weird animals. Uh, it, that it was a complete water world, which is certainly also a possibility, or that it was an arid desert. And I put these two asterisks here because this is the only theory that in fact proved to be correct. It is an arid desert, uh, but it's a lot more too. It's got an incredibly dense atmosphere and uh, it's a uh, Atmospheric, the clouds that you see are actually acidic clouds, so that it uh, really wouldn't be a very fun place to visit. But Venus is about the same size as, as we are, and uh, planetary studies since then have established that a lot of volcanism went on the surface, uh, on the surface. And uh, I'm happy to see that they're finally planning additional. Uh, orbiting spacecraft for the coming decade, where hopefully we'll find out a lot more about Venus, and in particular, why it a planet that's uh, very much like the Earth to begin with would then become sort of a runaway greenhouse effect with temperatures in excess of 700 degrees on the surface today. Uh, and so at the time, even people thought that one could see holes in the clouds and you might be able to see the surface. I mean, we're just completely and utterly clueless. And also, we didn't even know what the actual rotation period of Venus was at the time, nor of the planet Mercury. So a lot of stuff, just basic stuff, was not known. And that's not that long ago when you think about it. Mars, of course, has always been the most enticing planet ever since Percival Lowell and Schiaparelli thought they saw canals. And Lowell, of course, pushed that they had advanced aliens, intelligent aliens. And then H.G. Wells wrote his famous, infamous novel, The War of the Worlds, all based on Martian, smart Martians that want to invade us. But it, it, things as he put, for example, these are the very first color photographs of Mars. These were published in Life magazine and caused a sensation worldwide. They were taken by William Finson, who was then at Union Observatory in South Africa. And he used the uh, Kodachrome, the very first really reliable 35 millimeter color film, and took these beautiful images. And you notice that the, the planet looks sort of pinkish, but you also see sort of blue-green type shades. So again, this was sort of semi-confirmation that maybe, just maybe, some of these dark features are due to vegetation. And then in 1956, Richard Layton at Mount Wilson Observatory used the 100-inch telescope, and he actually did a better color balance and took this picture, which made Mars look more like a desert, uh, and of course, that's what the true picture and the true image of Mars was like. But at the time, again, you know, it was, was it this or was it that? Because color film was not that reliable in terms of actually showing you the correct color of, of astronomical objects. The other, uh, the, the, there are lots of things you didn't know, but the biggest one in terms of, uh, of what applies today uh, was up to the point that Gene Shoemaker proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the meteor crater here in Arizona was the result not of volcanism, but of a huge impact. Uh, in other words, an asteroid came and hit and basically uh, the pressure caused the, much of the material to actually become a fused quartz-like and spewed it out. And then you had a little bit of a central peak and walls. Uh, prior to that, the favorite theory is the one over here that was uh, put forth by two British astronomers, Naismith and Carpenter, who were convinced that everything you, they saw on the moon was due to volcanism. And since many of the craters of the moon have these central peaks, uh, they thought that this is where the volcano would erupt and then throw this wall during the eruption uh, in a circular fashion around it. If you ever get a chance to look at the, their book, it's just beautifully illustrated. And they actually have a lot of models of, uh, which are completely wrong, but very, very elegant <laughs> look to look at, models mm -hmm. of plaster of Paris, what they thought the surface of the moon would look like. 
But uh, then by about 1960, Gene Shoemaker, uh, as far, actually as part of his PhD thesis, uh, proved beyond a reasonable doubt that, uh, that this crater, which sits amid a volcanic field here, since most of our, our mountains in Arizona are volcanic in origin, this was clearly different from any of those. And then he applied that reasoning to lunar craters and uh, we were off and running. And finally, the, I was actually involved in Montreal uh, in, a, in a real astronomical research project. Uh, Dr. Peter Melman, who was an outstanding uh, uh, expert on meteors and asteroids in his day, uh, he worked at the National Research Council of Canada, and he reached out to all the local astronomy clubs, both in Canada and the U.S., to do systematic observations of meteors during great meteor showers. And here's an observatory that was set up in Ottawa, and you notice it's got these heated coffins, as everybody jokingly called them, so that you could do this in the winter. And basically, people would be looking at a... a eighth section of, of the sky, memorized as much as they could, the stars and, and names and, and so forth. And then whenever a meteor struck, uh, flew across, you would give its direction, its color and its magnitude. And Milman then would put together that information as a huge database because it was still not sure in those days whether meteors during showers especially would pose a serious hazard to satellites that we launched, and of course, the hope for human missions in space. So it's very exciting to actually be part of a research team. And I was very lucky to, uh, I was able to uh, meet one of the true giants of, uh, uh, of astronomy, uh, Dr. Cecilia Payne-Kaboshkin. Some of you may know who she is, I know Barry and Ann do. Uh, she was uh, the one of the first, if not the first, uh, female a PhD at Harvard College Observatory. She came from Britain uh, and uh, decided to attend Harvard because she could. She wanted to be an astronomer in England, but nobody would have her because women, quotes, didn't do that sort of thing. And Harold Shapley uh, it, it, it took her on as he did with many other women who then mostly became observers and data gatherers. But she was quite a feisty independent woman and she, uh, she was crowned at the time she would have gotten a, today rather she would have gotten a Nobel prize for her discovery, but she was the first to actually prove that unlike the earth and the moon and planets, which you know consist of a, a certain combination of all the elements we know of, Stars, and especially the sun and others, were composed of more or less 99% of just hydrogen and helium with just trace amounts of some heavier elements. And when she published her findings or published her thesis, nobody believed her. They just thought this can't be. She actually had to retract that initially until one of the male astronomers at, Low, at uh, uh, Harvard confirmed it a few years later. And we invited her each year. Our club had a small endowment so that we could bring in superstars of astronomy for a lecture and a visit. And she visited us and gave a great talk and then visited us at our observatory in Montreal. And I always liked what she said because that's how so many of us, who, she encouraged all of us to go into science Young people, it doesn't matter what you do. It's just science is the greatest adventure you can follow and so forth. And of course, here's what she said. And I just love this. The reward of a young scientist is the emotional thrill of being the first person in the history of the world to see something or to understand something. Nothing can compare with that experience. The reward of the old scientist is the sense of having a vague sketch grow into a masterly landscape. I think that's just beautifully said. <laughs> okay, uh, when, uh, after I graduated with my PhD in 1972, um, I then entered, uh, was hired by one of Canada's leading universities at the time, uh, at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, one of the 
sort of Canadian Ivy Leagues, and I did nothing but research, grant writing, teaching, etc. And I really didn't have time for much astronomy, uh, unfortunately. I never let go of it fully, but I really couldn't do it. And sold out my telescopes. I couldn't afford. Before that, as a graduate student, I had to just you know needed the money. And then in 1980, uh, after our daughter was born, my wife Margaret and I, I took a sabbatical leave to California, where I was visiting scientists at the um, uh, in one of the medical institutions there, which was uh, in 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 uh, Pas near Pasadena. And I was determined to buy myself a, a telescope again. And I went to the Celestron factory. And at that time, the famous mass-produced C8, the orange-colored 8-inch uh, telescope, was the one runway best telescope ever made. Uh, thousands of them were sold because it had a nice, sizable telescope and a tiny package. And they also had a 10 inch telescope and I was able to find this one uh, at the uh, at the Celestron factory, uh, which had been completely modernized and cleared up and so on. And in the 1960s, when the company was called Celestron Pacific, they actually made Johnson, who was the inventor of making schmidt Cassegrain telescopes, they actually started making a whole array of telescopes up to 22 inches in aperture intended for college research and so on. So that was that was my re rediscovery of astronomy. And I started taking more pictures of the moon and Mars in the 1980s. And then my first go at photographing the Orion Nebula on film. This exposure was probably half an hour or longer. You had to sit there manually guiding uh, on a guide star uh, and try not to fall asleep while this was happening in order to capture a half decent color image on film since the films were so slow in that in those days. Eventually I got better at a whole bunch of things and in, in 1988, uh, Mars, the opposition of Mars that year was one of the best possible. Uh, Mars came as close as it possibly can by that time, I had a Celestron 14-inch, a much larger telescope, and access to this new super high-resolution Kodak technical pan film. So here I took lots of photographs, but I could still see more visually uh, because you cannot capture on film really all the subtle detail the eye can catch. So I would sketch it, take a, oops, take a picture, uh, and then I combined the two into one of these, which I call photo sketches. And uh, a number of these were published in Astronomy and Sky and Telescope magazine. In sharp contrast, this was taken done with a 14 inch telescope. In sharp contrast, in one of the recent uh, positions of Mars here, I took this image with a digital camera with a six inch refractor. And of course it's far better than anything prior to that. A good indication of how far imaging technology has come. In California too, I had lots of time to, uh, uh, to uh, indulge in astronomy. Uh, I, was, uh, uh, I was recruited by California State University uh, in uh, 1990 uh, to be uh, a dean of the College of Science. Uh, and uh, that was a demanding job, but I, I joined a group of other amateurs and new moon weekends, weather permitting, we would head off into Joshua Tree or other uh, de desert um, venues to under dark skies and camaraderie and really had a lot of fun. The other big thing that... Uh, uh, was a sort of a haven for amateur astronomy in California was the Riverside Telescope Makers Conference, which always had vendors there showing you the latest and the best and the, you know, and the least affordable new stuff. But it was a great gathering as well in the mountains just behind where we live. And then in July of 1991, Perhaps some of you remember that was one of the most spectacular solar eclipses ever because it was the longest possible totality 
about six minutes. So uh, some ALPO members and I headed south to uh, the tip of Baja, California, and the little, the capital of Baja La Paz, and we were treated like kings, lots of visitors there for this. And here are some of the pictures that I was able to capture on film at that point. Uh, and it was just a spectacular, un unforgettable event. I also visited uh, Mount Palomar and uh, Mount Wilson Observatories. And uh, we were actually able to, um, um, this is a, an amateur astronomer who was a docent at Wilson, Mount Wilson. And this is the infamous and famous 60 inch reflector for many years, the largest telescope in the world at the beginning of the 20th century and also one of the best optically. And we could run time on it for several hours and actually look through a beautiful dark deep sky objects, uh, quite a privilege and a lot of fun. And then in 1999 and 2000, um, I was really privileged to team up uh, with my uh, longtime friend, Terence Dickinson, who is a prolific uh, astronomy author and uh, uh, writer. And uh, we actually applied for observing time at Sighting Spring Observatory in Australia, New South Wales, because we wanted to go down and do a systematic astroimaging survey of the southern sky. I'd never been there. And uh, here's the big dome that had its four meter telescope. And uh, this observatory sits on the rim of an extinct volcano about 4,000 feet above sea level. In some of the darkest skies you can imagine. And if you've never been to the Southern Hemisphere, I can highly recommend it. Uh, it is, makes our northern stars and sky look pretty pale in comparison. If the center of the Milky Way is overhead uh, in the middle of the night, it actually is so bright that it casts a shadow. It's just spectacular. Wow. wow. Then in 2006, we retired to Flagstaff and uh, uh, made a whole bunch of new friends. And uh, I was very quick to have built an observatory, which some of you have seen. Uh, here we are chairing its uh, inauguration. And here you see it in the middle of the winter. <laughs> uh, that's uh, been just so much fun to have and something that's basically been a dream my entire life, and here we are. Now, apparently there's been a renaming of some of the planets, as some of you might have heard, and I just thought that you, you'd be interested in seeing what some of them are. Uh, and notice Doug over here has uh, changed his name, anyways. <laughs> and uh, then I was able to take some of the first digital images of uh, uh, with a CCD camera in 2005. Uh, and I shot these, this image of Saturn through the 24-inch clock. And uh, also, I was able to shoot uh, several, take several nice lunar frames. Uh, here's a, uh, it's a, a couple of the, uh, of the prominent craters on the moon. To give you a sense of scale, these are approximately 100 miles across. And viewing them through this gorgeous telescope is quite a privilege. And I was a volunteer, active volunteer in the public program at Lowell uh, until just a couple of years ago. And uh, I was really honored because the observatory uh, named an asteroid in my honor for, for that service. Uh, so that was totally unexpected. Cool. So now cool. there's a little rock out there somewhere that has my name on it. And who knows if I'll ever see it because I tried imaging it. Unfortunately, its orbit is such that it's smack in the middle of the Milky Way among, among billions of stars. So I'll never be able to capture a picture of it, but I know it's out there. And finally, one of the most exciting travels I ever undertook, again with Terence Dickinson, we went to the Atacama area of Chile in 1909, and uh, there's just absolutely 
no place on earth that compares in terms of clear skies, uh, lack of light pollution, uh, arid air, and at an elevation of about 8,000 feet in a little town called San Pedro de Atacama. We, had, we stayed there in a, in a small hotel, which caters entirely to amateur ast and professional astronomers visiting. This was the view from our uh, hotel room every morning. Uh, this is the uh, a, a nearly 20,000 foot volcano called Ikankabur. And this is the road that leads this passageway from uh, um, Chile to Argentina. And on this plateau is where it, it wasn't then, but since they have built the fantastic uh, international observatory called ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter uh, uh, Observatory, or I forgot what it means. We also went and visited the European Southern Observatory, which is the largest one in the world and has four eight meter telescopes. And Terence took this middle of the night image of the telescopes with the Milky Way, spectacular picture. And just a, a wonderful country. I, I can really, really recommend that the, the uh, Chile has got one of the highest standards of living in South America, and it's got a very highly educated population. And they love astronomers because they bring in lots of money and with all the observatories that are being built there and all of the people have come down to visit it. Plus the geology is unbelievable. And here's the pictures I took down there. Uh, I was able to rent some of the telescopes at the location. Here's the uh, Large Magellanic Cloud and it has one of the largest star forming regions called the Tarantula Nebula. And here it is up close and personal. Mm. Also in the southern hemisphere, you see, we can see it here sometimes scraping the horizon, but this is the largest uh, globular cluster we know of, and it's estimated to have at least a million stars in it. This thing is the size of the moon, by the way, uh, to the naked eye, uh, and uh, you really see it beautifully down, down under. And this is the largest star forming region in our own galaxy. And this is a picture I took uh, with a small refractor there. And it's called the Carina Nebula. And, you know, we love our, our um, Orion Nebula, beautiful as it is. Uh, but relative to this, it's about this big in contrast. So you can imagine how big this whole thing is. And this color is, although exaggerated in, after, in the photograph, you can, if you have a big telescope, look at it and it really looks pink. It's just spectacular, just gorgeous. And then in 2012, uh, to finish up, uh, here is uh, another event, a scientific event that I was able to participate in at Lowell Observatory, doing the transit of Venus, which as you know, is a relatively rare thing. Uh, this gentleman over here, Dr. Paolo Tanga, who is uh, an astronomer at Nice Observatory in France, and a team decided to send observers all around the world to observe this event with specially made telescopes that you can see here, they're called coronagraphs. And since uh, Paolo uh, knew me and also William Sheehan, this is, this is Bill Burke, by the way, uh, and we assisted him, here we are in action, actually taking some of the data that Paolo needed for his uh, project. And here you see down in this corner, this is the edge of the sun being blocked out by this coronagraph. And then you see here the Venus, the, uh, you can see just the atmosphere of Venus being backlit by the corona. And you see this bright little aureole, or what this referred to as a refresh. So it, the atmosphere acts like a giant lens and reflects, uh, refracts the light of the corona across so that we could see it. And the astronomers were interested in that because this tells them a lot about the atmosphere of Venus, its density and composition. And this kind of information will become very, very useful when we start studying more of the exoplanets that we are uh, now discovering in great numbers, stars or uh, planets around other stars. So this was really a privilege to, to be able to do that. And uh, 
just to give you a finish up, here's the best color image of a very famous and beautiful uh, star forming region in Sagittarius called Messier 8, the Lagoon Nebula. I was so proud of this image that I took with my Celestron 14 on color film. This is about a half hour exposure. Here's one that I took with the same telescope a few years later uh, with a digital camera. And you can see just at an instant glance how much the technology has allowed us to do better, much, much better imaging. See way more detail with the same telescope. And this exposure was maybe a total of two by three minute, uh, uh, two by six minute rather exposures stacked together as opposed to close to an hour. So astrophotography has taken giant leaps and, and now we amateurs with small telescopes can often take pictures that rival the best of professionals. Here's a picture I took of uh, the, um, not the recent uh, lunar eclipse, but a real totality a few years ago. Uh, and then here's an image I took of the new moon with earth shadow. Uh, and uh, it's always fun. You could take pretty pictures and enjoy yourself. And another example here, finally, I think this is my last one, shows the, again the beautiful crater Copernicus that I showed you early on when I took it with film. Uh, here it is, an image, a low resolution image taken by the at the lunar orbiter, the LRO, uh, and the again, this is about 100 miles across. And here's an image I took with my 12-inch reflecting telescope and a digital camera, and shows you how much detail now can be recorded with a modest-sized telescope, thanks to these advances in, in technology. It's just mind-boggling. And here's Comet Neowise. I hope some of you saw that when it was around a couple of years ago. Here's an image of Jupiter I took with uh, my one of my telescopes and the moon Io in transit again. And this beautiful object is called Thor's Helmet. This is actually a star forming region, which looks incredibly unusual for a variety of reasons. By the way, the colors are not just haphazard when you see colors here. The red coloration is due to ionized hydrogen, and the blue coloration is due to light being reflected off interstellar dust and other things. Here's another beautiful nebula, the Rosette, amply named uh, because of its beautiful appearance. And then here's another one. Again, here's the blue, which is reflection, and the red, which is emission. Uh, all these star forming regions, this one in Sagittarius, and this one is uh, uh, one that is in winter constellation. And if any of you are fans of uh, Orion, the constellation, the beautiful constellation we enjoy in the winter, here's the Horsehead Nebula. This is a composite I took of several images in, in sequence the Horsehead, the Flame, and then this is the Orion Nebula. And I just took a whole series of small images and pasted them, cut them, pasted them all together with software, of course. Again, something that a few years ago with photography, film photography would have been virtually impossible. Here's the Veil Nebula. This is a remnant of a supernova that exploded uh, a long time ago. And you're just seeing the leftovers was the uh, uh, dust clouds containing hydrogen and other elements being blown apart <coughs> over time. And then galaxies, you're all familiar, I hope, with the Andromeda galaxy. And here is the beautiful, the biggest near one to us, uh, actually visible with the naked eye. And it's a trio because it has two small dwarf galaxies, kind of like our Magellanic clouds that actually are satellites around it. And here's a message uh, for all of you if you have kids. And uh, that's it, folks. <laughs> <laughs>